What's up guys? I'm sure like me, many of you have a good amount of money invested in the stock market and have gotten your portfolio pretty beaten up over the past couple of weeks. And it's been the same for me. However, thanks to a few strategies and some foresight, I'm down less than I would be otherwise. So in this video, I'm gonna go over some ways you can protect your portfolio from big down moves and potentially even make more money in that case. Now, I do want to emphasize, I am not going to advocate any kind of day trading. And obviously I can't even guarantee any of this would be a good idea because for all I know, we've already reached the bottom and all of this could be too late. I have no idea. So don't consider any of this actual investing or trading advice that you should do. It's purely just informational. So you can know some additional strategies going forward and have more choices if you want to adjust your risk. I also want to point out that I'll do my best to introduce you to these concepts, but a lot of these strategies go way deeper than I could possibly get into in one video, so you should definitely research each of these concepts further if you plan to use them. And of course, always remember that if you are a very long-term investor, the lowest risk strategy is usually to just buy and hold, so if that's you, it may just be best to not do any of this. Anyway, with all that out of the way though, let's get started with simple stuff that's easiest to understand. The the first thing to know about is short selling, which you may have heard of. Basically, this is the exact opposite of going long or buying a stock. And you make money when the stock you short sell goes down. With this, instead of buying and then trying to sell higher, with short selling, you first borrow shares from the broker, immediately sell them, and then try to buy them back or cover them at a lower price. So instead of buy low, sell high, it's sell high, buy low in that order. Beware though, there are some extra risks to short selling that you don't have to consider when buying stocks. First, you have to pay borrow fees, which are like interest on the shares that you are borrowing from the broker, usually a few percentage points per year. The longer you go between short selling and covering, the more you pay. Also, short selling theoretically has unlimited loss because you lose money when the stock goes up and there is no upper price limit. Whereas if you buy a stock, the worst that can happen is it goes to zero. So basically, if you think the stock market is going to go lower, you can make money on the way down by short selling something like an index ETF. Now, one alternative to short selling is buying shares in what's called an inverse ETF, which basically has short holdings built in such that the share price of the inverse ETF will go up when the index it mirrors goes down and vice versa. The benefit of this arrangement is you can't have unlimited losses because the worst that happens is the inverse ETF goes bust and it can't have a negative share price. Also, they're designed to rebalance daily. So this inverse relationship only matches on a day-to-day -day basis. What I mean by this is if on Monday, for example, the S&P 500 goes up 10%, then an S&P inverse ETF like the symbol SH would go down by 10%. But there's also leveraged inverse ETFs that are designed to multiply the original move. So let's say it's a 2x leverage inverse ETF and the S&P goes down 10% one day, the 2x inverse ETF would go up 20% that day. These introduce twice as much risk though, if you're wrong. All right, so that's short selling and inverse ETFs, which I'd assume is more for active investors and less so long-term investors. And I wouldn't recommend it for most people, to be honest. On the other hand, if you're a long-term investor looking to keep holding on to your stocks, but want to limit your risk to major black swan events, you have lots of options. Literally, we're talking about options now. This is where things might become pretty foreign to you if you don't know how options work. And even if you know what they are for, there are a lot of intricacies to consider and complex strategies you can use with them. So this will be a pretty basic introduction to just one aspect of them, mostly buying put options. And you'll definitely want to do further research before actually putting your money to work with any of this. But let me rewind for a second. What even are options? Essentially, they are a contract to have the option to exchange a stock at a certain price within a certain time frame, and usually all options are good for 100 shares. And there is a seller or writer of an option and a buyer of an option. I'm mostly just gonna be talking about buying options today. And there are basically just two types of options, either a call option and a put option. If you buy a call option, you're basically saying you want the option to buy a stock at a certain price. And if you buy a put option, you want the option to sell your stock at a certain price. But there are two other components to know about, which are the expiration date and the so-called strike price, which is 
just the price the particular option is based around. And of course, these options aren't free and costs money to buy called the premium. All right, this might sound complicated, so let me give you an example. Say you own 100 shares of Apple stock and Apple is trading at $300, so it's all worth $30,000. You're worried about the price of Apple going down. So you buy a single put option with a strike price of $300, the same price it's trading at right now, and an expiration of three months out. And you pay a premium of $6 per share for this option, which is $600 total for it. Now, this put option will give you the right to sell your 100 shares of Apple to the seller of the option at any point in the next three months at $300 each, even if the price goes down. So say Apple drops to $250, you could exercise your option and then sell the Apple stock for $30,000, even though it's only worth 25,000 at the new price. But here's the cool thing. You don't have to exercise the option and actually get rid of your Apple shares because the contract itself has value. So you can just sell the option itself for a profit instead, you can sell it back. In this example, because the put option has a strike of $300 and Apple is at $250, your contract will now be worth around $5,000 more because it's for 100 shares. So you can just sell the option to another buyer to get rid of it at a profit, basically canceling out whatever loss you had from the Apple shares losing value. This is why buying put options is often compared to buying insurance. You don't actually have to own any stock though to buy an option in the first place. You can just buy one to bet the stock will go down and then sell it before expiration. There is more that you need to understand that I'll get to in a second. But if you're wondering about call options, they're based basically the opposite, where instead of profiting when a stock goes down, you profit when a stock goes up because a call option gives you the right to buy a stock at a strike price. So if you buy a $300 call option for Apple and the price of Apple goes to $350, you make $5,000 because it's for 100 shares. Before you go out and buy options though, there are two more critical factors in options you must understand. First is time value and the other is volatility. First, let's talk about time premium or time value. It's also called theta value. It doesn't matter, it's all the same thing. As you would expect, it costs more money to buy an option with a much longer expiration date because the more time you have, the higher the chance of the stock ending up in the money, meaning above the call strike price or below the put strike. And remember, someone had to sell the option to take the other side of the trade. And the longer expiration option is much more risky for the seller or writer of the option, so they charge more premium to offset that risk. So. When you buy an option, it can have both time value and intrinsic value. The time value is just the value the option has just from the chance of the stock price going through the strike by expiration, whereas intrinsic value is from the actual difference in stock price and strike price. I think it's time for another example. Let's take our $300 strike three month Apple put option again, and the price of Apple stock is also $300 and say you paid $10 a share for the option, so $1,000. Right now, the option has zero intrinsic value because the strike is the same as Apple's price. So it would be pointless to exercise now. But right after you buy it, the contract is still worth $1,000 because of the time value. So you could resell it pretty much what you paid for right after you buy it, assuming the Apple stock price doesn't move very much. But if you wait two months, say, and Apple's price is still at $300, that time value has diminished, and it might now only be worth $400 or $4 per share if you went to resell it and by the time expiration happens, there is no time value left. So if Apple's price hasn't dropped below $300, that option is totally worthless. One consequence of this is you need to consider the premium in your profit and loss potential. Because say at the three month expiration, Apple is at $290. Because the put option has a strike of $300 and it's good for 100 shares, its intrinsic value is $1,000 because it's the difference of 300 and 290 times 100 shares. So you can either sell the contract or exercise it and get $1,000 for it. But remember, you paid $1,000 for the premium on the option three months ago. So you've just broken even. 
on a put option, your break even price is always the strike price minus the premium. And for the call option, the break even is the strike price plus the premium. So in that example, it all worked out because the final value of the contract was at least as much as the premium paid. But say you paid $15 a share for the option or $1,500 total for the $300 strike price. And again, it expired when Apple was at $290, so a final intrinsic value again of $1,000. This time, you actually paid $500 more in premium than you got back. You actually lost more than you would have had you not bought the option at all because you paid too much premium. Before we move on to volatility, two quick side notes. First, the price of options premium is obviously going to be proportional to the price of the underlying stock. So on Amazon, which has a cost around like $2,000 per share at some point, that option is going to cost way more than on AMD, which is only like $50, because a $2,000 stock is going to move way more in dollar amount than a $50 stock. And even if both move by the same percentage, but that should be common sense. Next side note, is most of the time, it does not make sense to exercise an option early long before expiration. And instead, you should usually just sell the option back. This is because if you exercise an option, say a month early, you profit from the intrinsic value, but you forfeit the time value. Whereas if you sell the contract, you receive the profit from the intrinsic value plus whatever remaining time value premium. Now, besides how long until expiration and the price of the underlying stock, the other major factor that affects the options prices is volatility, specifically what's known as implied volatility, which is basically how big the movements in a stock or the market as a whole are expected to be. On a stock like Tesla, which is known for having large percentage swings in price, options are relatively going to be a lot more expensive than something like Berkshire Hathaway, which is more stable. And it might not be so obvious because Tesla stock costs more than Berkshire, so its options will cost more anyway. But what I mean is the break evens on Tesla will be a larger percentage away from the strikes than on Berkshire. But here's where things get tricky because implied volatility can change over time or in a very short amount of time, which heavily affects your profit or losses in ways that might not be obvious. Take Tesla, for example. Let's say Elon Musk makes a tweet that says, in one month, I'm going to make an announcement for Tesla that will change the world forever. You are going to absolutely lose your mind. Immediately after that happens, the expectation for Tesla stock changes. You'll probably expect, wow, people are gonna buy a lot of Tesla stock before this announcement, or man, if this announcement is really that great, Tesla stock will go through the roof. To account for this, those selling options are going to demand more premium because obviously Tesla is going to start moving more than usual because of this upcoming announcement. So they will demand way more premium than before to take on that extra risk. So say you have a Tesla call option or even a put option expiring in two months after the announcement. Your option is probably worth way more than it was before even if Tesla stock hasn't moved much. So you can kind of think of the volatility like a multiplier of time premium. At least that's how I think about it. Now, volatility can work either for you or against you depending on the circumstances. Obviously, if you are holding an option when volatility increases, you benefit because you can now sell back your option for more than you could before. In fact, if volatility increases enough, the overall value of your contract could actually go up even if the price moves against you slightly. However, if volatility is much higher than usual, you have to be careful what's called a volatility crush. This happens when volatility drops a lot quickly, which often happens after pre-scheduled binary events like earnings or an expected announcement. In our Tesla example, let's say you think the announcement is going to be awesome and the price is going to skyrocket. So you buy a call option and pay a ton of premium. Doesn't matter the exact amount here, it's just an expensive option. But that's fine you think because there's such a good chance this price is going to the moon. But the next day, Elon Musk comes on stage and announces some boring new car no one likes, or even a decent car, but not nearly as game-changing as his tweet suggested. So the stock price only goes up a little bit. Well, now that there is no more mystery, volatility on options prices are going to plummet. So no one is willing to buy it back from you at that high price anymore. Even though the stock price moved in your favor, because the thing that was expected to move the price turned out to be a dud, your option is actually worth less than before. So you lost money because one factor of the options prices, volatility, 
went against you, even though the price moved with you, and even though the timed expiration was basically the same. Now, how can you tell what the implied volatility of a stock is? Most decent trading platforms should tell you on what's called the options chain, which is just a list of all the options available for a stock. And the volatility might be different depending on how far out the expiration date is because of stuff like announcements, like in our other example. But not only is it important to know about the volatility of the individual stock, but the market as a whole. In times like this, where we have a black swan event, such as a virus going around, obviously the entire market is going crazy with huge swings in prices on basically every single stock, even the S&P 500 index itself. Probably the best way to measure the entire market's volatility is using the VIX, which is the short name for the Chicago Board of Options Exchange Volatility Index. This index will tell you how relatively volatile the market is or is expected to be for the next 30 days and it's derived from options prices on the S&P 500 index options. So the VIX doesn't determine options prices, but rather the VIX tells you about options prices. If options prices, and therefore the VIX, is high, it means the S&P 500 index, which is often a benchmark for the entire market, is more volatile. So if you look at the VIX over the years, you'll see obvious huge spikes from major market events and low periods when not much was happening. Like at the end of 2019, when the market was just chugging upwards, the VIX was very low, below 15 mostly. But then in 2020, when the pandemic started, you see a massive spike over a few weeks. In fact, this spike at the moment of recording peaked around 77, the highest it's been since the global financial crisis in 2008. If you line up the S&P 500 and the VIX, you'll immediately notice the VIX usually goes up when there are big drops in the S&P, which is just because it's more likely for big drops to cause panic selling, which then causes bigger drops, but the flip side doesn't really happen. You may have heard the expression, the market takes the stairs up and the elevator down. The important point with all this though, is to remember that as fear in the market grows and the market drops further, options prices will continue to go higher. So if the VIX is sky high, it will be harder to make a profit from buying put options or even call options because the premiums will be so high. So if you think the market is going to drop massively, you can go ahead and buy an option and still profit if you're right, but you stand to lose more if you're wrong. So really the best time to buy put options was a while ago back when the whole pandemic was just getting started. Then you benefit not just from profiting from the price moving in your favor, but also the huge volatility expansion. So I think this video is probably long enough at this point, and really I just scratched the surface with some of these concepts. When it comes to options, there are a ton of other strategies you can look up if you wanna know more. Stuff like vertical spreads, which involves both buying and selling options simultaneously at different strikes. There's also covered calls, a lot more. It's not something you can just learn in a day, unfortunately, but hopefully this was a good introduction. So yeah, if you wanna keep watching though, the next video I'd recommend is one I made about some legitimate ways to make some extra money online. So if you wanna check that out, I'll put that link right here. So thanks so much for watching guys, and I'll see you in the next video.